So first of all, thanks everybody for being here today. Uh, pretty dynamic lineup of speakers and panelists. Thank you. Um, and really we're all here to talk about how can we work together to make greater Cincinnati, uh, the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana region a better place to live, work, and visit. Um, civilizations have risen and fallen around particular innovations. Um, with the Greeks, it was brass. With the Romans, it was roads and aqueducts. Uh, in the United States, uh, we've really played a leading role through the Industrial Revolution and beyond. But now we're seeing other nations begin to outpace us as it relates to digital transformation efforts. And I believe that the Smart Cities effort uh, represents an opportunity for us to take a leading role uh, from the local level. And I think that that's exactly what we're doing here today. Um, it was here in Cincinnati that we started Venture Smarter. Uh, we now have operations in D.C. and New York, as far away as Amsterdam and the Netherlands. It was also here in Cincinnati that we launched the first regional smart cities initiative in the United States, and that is uh, what ultimately led to us launching Smart Cincy uh, as a public-private partnership. Uh, since we started that, our friends in Columbus who are here today have launched the Smart Regions Task Force. Our friends in Colorado have launched statewide efforts with the Colorado Smart Cities Alliance. Um, and our friends in Arizona have launched a center at Arizona State University to focus on smart cities and regions. Uh, smart Cincy represents a unique movement that is gaining, tra uh, gaining traction within the otherwise technology-driven conversations that are smart cities. I contend that smart communities is a preferred term to smart cities because smart cities put people first. Smart Cincy puts people first, positioning the community at the forefront of all of our planning decisions. What problems can we solve? How can we make Cincinnati and the OKI region a better place to live, work, and visit? How can we use technology as a tool to improve outcomes for people? And how can we create a model for smart regional growth that is repeatable? How will all of these technologies work together? And how in the world are we going to pay for it? One year ago, we gathered in this room and we asked, what does Smart Cincy mean to you? We collected feedback online and offline. We've hosted monthly meetings and forums. And we've continued to bring together each stakeholder group to create a cohesive, proactive conversation to move greater Cincinnati further along into the 21st century. And in doing so, it's our hope that we are ensuring that everybody, regardless of socioeconomic or physical barriers, has equal access to all of the new opportunities that we're working together to create. In the last 12 months, new projects have been launched. New solutions to existing and emerging problems have been identified and explored. New partnerships forged. New businesses created, bringing in new jobs and millions of dollars in investments. In Cincinnati, we are looking to solve issues from digital divide and workforce development to equitable mobility and public health. A common theme for us revolves around closing the gap. But Cincinnati will not become a smart city, and OKI will not become a smart region without collaboration. That's why we are excited to work with and learn from our peer cities and regions, from Columbus to Kansas City, from Louisville to San Jose, from Indianapolis to Buffalo. Last year, we gathered to catalyze conversations. Today, we are meeting to catalyze action, to discuss projects and potentials, challenges and solutions, and of course, opportunities to collaborate, such as in the 2018 Smart Infrastructure Challenge, of which you'll hear more about later today. Today, you will also hear from leaders in government at the local, regional, state, and federal level, from business and community leaders, from researchers and academic partners. We will talk about the pillars and components of smart cities, and we will have a targeted conversation around smart mobility and infrastructure. But why is our focus there? It's because we want to solve our most pressing problems by leveraging advanced technologies and smart strategies. We want to optimize or altogether replace outdated and inefficient systems and infrastructure that are depleting already strained municipal and state budgets. We want to bolster social mobility and spark innovative, inclusive economic development. We want to mitigate air quality problems, better connect residents to jobs, to healthcare, and to education, and make our streets and sidewalks safer for motorists, pedestrians, and bikers alike. We want to close the socioeconomic divide, address digital access and digital literacy, and prompt smart action around education and workforce development as our city and region steps forward into the 21st century. We don't push the uncomfortable conversations aside. We have been actively working with the Hamilton County Heroin Coalition to move the conversation forward to address the heroin and opiate epidemic, with Tri-State Logistics Council and other regional groups to align forces around transit and transportation solutions, and with government partners to build internal capacities and external partnerships so that we can actually pursue smart city grants and resources that we've missed historically. But I, don't, but I won't dive deeper. We have a stellar lineup of speakers and panelists today, 
For those in the audience and those watching on the live stream, we are excited that you are a part of the conversation, and we thank you for the support. And we also want to thank all of our sponsors and partners that make this event possible. Everyone here and tuned in remotely deserves a round of applause, so thank you for being here. Uh, without going on longer, I want to turn the attention to our elected officials from the city of Cincinnati with us today to say a few words. Without the support from City Hall, Smart City efforts wouldn't be able to move forward. The first speaker was the first member of council to voice support for Smart City's efforts and has been a champion of community-driven conversations that explore smart and connected technologies. It is my pleasure to introduce council member P.G. Sittenfeld. Good morning, uh, as Zach said, my name is P.G. Sittenfeld. I chair the committee at City Hall that oversees uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And along with my great colleague, Council Member Tamaya Denard, it's our pleasure to offer a welcome on behalf of the city. One personal housekeeping item, obviously the building, Union Hall, where we're gathered, uh, is I'd say the HQ for our sort of startup ecosystem locally. For those of you that don't know this, this also used to be a beer hall. I mention those things only to say you have my personal permission. If you came wearing a tie today, you're allowed to take it off. I just want you to, want you to know that. Um, there, there's no doubt, and this is part of why we're here, that we have more work to do to make the city of Cincinnati as smart uh, as we want it to be. But I'm also proud to say that we have made uh, real and meaningful strides. I wanted to highlight a few of those. Your city government uh, is currently in the midst of laying a fiber loop encompassing downtown, and this will really be the platform on the foundation that we can build future smart city applications. I think you're gonna hear several times today from Lee Tammy, who for the city of Cincinnati runs our Office of Performance and Data Analytics. And I think it's worth emphasizing how seriously we take using data to solve problems and to better deliver services. This uh, you know, manifests itself in everything from uh, tracking when and where heroin doses occur so that we can better align the services and the response to those to also you know, offering constituents real-time tracking of their snowplow monitor. My office and my uh, great chief of staff, Alita Kamine, is with me today. We've tried to lead the charge on issues of aging and accessibility. The city is currently in the midst of offering a uh, mo smart mobility app so that no matter your abilities as a Cincinnatian, you are able to better navigate the city. Many of you probably saw this, whether it was in our local media or in the Washington Post. Just a few months ago, we launched a first in the nation partnership to create, and I saw Pete Metz walk in, to create a smart mobility lab in partnership with Uber. So there's no question uh, that the future is coming at us fast. And as cities, but also with all of our partners, we need to grapple with questions like what is uh, the dawn of autonomous vehicles going to mean for how cities plan, how cities develop, and how cities grow. Finally, I would just because I do want to emphasize, you know, people don't always think about government as being the greatest supporter of what's happening in smart city solution and what's happening in our uh, innovation and startup ecosystem. And I think, you know, locally, Cincinnati very much defies that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the, even the place where we are gathered today, Union Hall, the city of Cincinnati was the indispensable supporter to create this space that has been a spot where the ecosystem can flourish. We're also proud supporters of uh, some of the inhabitants of this building, ranging from Centrifuge itself to Cincy Tech as well. So uh, I'll conclude by saying I know you all are in for an incredibly stimulating day, and the city is proud to uh, collaborate and partner with you to make Cincinnati uh, the smartest city can possibly be. So enjoy the day, and thank you so much. Thanks, PG. It's an honor to have you with us here uh, again this year. Uh, our next speaker has been a vocal advocate of Cincinnati's most at need residents and neighborhoods. She has inspired me and many other young leaders that believe that we can help make a difference in Cincinnati. She has shown everyone that if they don't give you a seat at the table, you can quite literally bring your own chair. It is an absolute privilege to introduce our next speaker, Council Member Tamaya Denard. Please welcome her to the stage. Good morning. Let me start that again. Good morning. That is awesome. I'm such an energy person. My name is Tamaya Denard, and I am uh, one of the newest members of Cincinnati City Council. I've been in for about four months now, or almost four months now, and it's been a very interesting time at City Hall. I have the, uh, the, the, the honor of uh, overseeing the Equity, Inclusion, Youth, and the Arts Committee, which I, 
is very near and dear to my heart because it covers the things that I care about uh, a lot, which is how do we bring more voices to the table? How do we look at the people who are most impacted by an issue and bring them to the forefront as a voice to design our way out of that issue? So I work at City Hall, but my other uh, brain, or my other side of my brain, uh, is working at Design Impact. And Design Impact, we're a nonprofit social innovation firm here in Cincinnati, and I'm very proud of the work that we do because the reason why, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to come to City Hall is to bring more creativity to City Hall. I felt like uh, government was drab and didn't have to be drab, and how do we make sure we bring um, more uh, exciting ideas to City Hall? And the one thing I, it most excites me about innovation, and particularly smart cities, is the notion that uh, accessibility and progress don't have to be mutually exclusive. And the narrative has been that if we want to be progressive, we have to leave certain voices out. And smart cities defies that, as Zach alluded to earlier. We can, you know, uh, be more innovative and look to the people on the margins to bring forth solutions. And so that's my goal at City Hall every day. I'm thinking, how do I bring more voice to uh, to the people who have been muffled or haven't been heard? And smart with smart cities is a, is a great way to do that. So I'm super encouraging and very supportive of technology. I think um, because I think you know my colleague PG said earlier, government hasn't traditionally been looked at as being innovative. Uh, but that's because we need to um, get more people who believe in innovation involved, both on the quantitative and the qualitative side of uh, and listening to people's stories and having that inform how we deliver our services is really important. So I'm honored to be with all of you, and I look forward to uh, learning a lot more about what's happening, what are you doing, and how I can leverage my seat at City Hall to give voice and uh, platform to your innovations. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Councilmember Denard. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, before we uh, before we dive into the rest of the speakers, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, one, we love this venue. Without uh, our partners at Centrifuge and Union Hall, of course, the summit and this initiative in itself wouldn't be possible. Um, so the first speaker that, that I'll welcome up here uh, is from Centrifuge. But before I make that introduction, uh, I want to make sure that everybody here has a, a good understanding of what's happening today, um, how to move around the venue. Um, and where to go if you have any questions. So uh, bathrooms on this floor directly behind us. Um, we'll be hosting uh, the, the A session panels in this room. So at 1015 and at 1115, there will be panels uh, in here on the second floor and then also on the fourth floor. Uh, the fourth floor will be where our B session panels are. Uh, the program is available online at smartcincy.org. We're trying to be conscious and not print out a bunch of uh, agendas. So uh, you can grab that digitally on your mobile device. Uh, if there are any questions, we do have uh, people at the help desk downstairs, um, and you can also uh, tweet at us, and you'll get an immediate response at Smart Cincy. Um, so uh, during the lunch session, we will be hosting um, also uh, two lunch and learn sessions. Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, local and transportation projects uh, in, in this room, and then on the fourth floor, we'll be, uh, we are honored to have the Pipeline uh, Water Innovation Cohort uh, pitch what they're working on and present what they're working on. Um, this year in the fourth floor. So uh, without me droning on any longer, I'd like to introduce uh, to the stage Eric Weissman, who is the Director of Marketing at Centrifuge. Eric. Good morning. As Zach said, I'm Eric Weissman with Centrifuge. Um, welcome to Union Hall. Just a real quick show of hands. How many people here for the first time? First timers. That's fantastic. It's always, it's always amazing that we, uh, I've been asking that question for the past two and a half years and we continue to get new people and new faces as part of the ecosystem here. Um, uh, so I've been part of the founding team of Centrifuge. Uh, I've been here for about four and a half years. Uh, it's amazing to see how this collaborative effort has really uh, combined efforts to, to move the city forward. And today is evidence of that. This is the second annual Smart Cincy Summit. So it's fantastic to see all these faces. And I'll just leave you with one thing real quick to remember as we bring this innovation, this tech-based economy together, there's an African proverb that I, I, I really like to, uh, I, I think it's relevant for moments like this. If you want to go fast, go by yourself. But if you want to go far, go together. And this is evidence of that. So Zach, take it away.
Thanks, Eric. And I want to um, give a special thanks also to Maurice Coffey, who's the uh, EIR from PNG working with Centrifuge right now. And he's been working uh, very diligently alongside of, of myself and a number of other collaborators to really drive forward this idea that Smart Cincy is a coalition and it's a public-private partnership that we are building together. So I think that that proverb that Eric, uh, that Eric mentioned reigns especially true. Um, so our first speaker today is somebody that I've had the pleasure of working with at the University of Cincinnati. Um, before working with Dr. Cohen, uh, I wasn't too well versed on what the potentials were as it relates to aerospace and smart cities or drones and UAVs in smart cities, but um, I'm sure that he'll, he'll share a little bit about what they're working on with the Ohio Department of Transportation, but I can say that it's an absolute honor to welcome to the stage Dr. Kelly Cohen from the University of Cincinnati. Hello and very good morning to all of you. I'm Interim Department Head, Aerospace Engineering, College of Applied Science uh, and uh, Engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, we've done a couple of firsts, 1929, the second oldest uh, aerospace engineering department in the United States. Our curriculum was set up by Orville White, Wright, one of the Wright brothers, and then uh, Neil Armstrong. After he came down from the moon, could have got a job anywhere. He came to us from 72 to 79, and next year, we're having a big happening, 50 years of the lunar landing. Now, so what are we doing here with smart cities? Ten years ago, we set out on a journey to extend what we're doing in aerospace into unmanned air vehicles. Search and rescue, that was the first application we worked on. And we did well, our portfolio started growing, and then we said, okay, if you've got one drone up in the air, let's have many of them, let's get them to talk. How do you get them to talk? Let's do that in an intelligent manner. So we worked on intelligent networking of unmanned systems. Um, we reached a situation where Air Force sponsored some of our work and that led to an AI system, genetic fuzzy. Fuzzy logic was once branded the cocaine of science. Um, but we decided to emulate human reasoning and we got that good that we're the only ones in the world that beat an F-16 pilot in combat situ uh, simulation and then another 12 after that um, and then we decided to uh, propose our work to the Department of Transportation. And uh, we got the biggest award in the state of Ohio for applying drones for transportation. What do we do? Well, we monitor traffic. We can be able to take a look at congested areas. Now, what's great about drones? We can fly 300, 400 feet, get that bird's eye view, and be able to do that on demand. Very quick deployment, excellent data, right? And then we can use that to make better decisions. We use that for bridge monitoring. We can identify cracks and very quickly on bridges, infrastructure, and then construction site, moving one place, building up. How do you get that information? We do all of that with FAA certification approval. Um, so a couple of months ago, uh, the VP of research asked me to set up out a team. And my reaction was, I got a heart attack. Literally, I was, you know, in hospital and all that, but then I recovered because of the excitement of this program. And, and, you know, 20 faculty from the University of Cincinnati, unprecedented, joined me together. And we decided to come up with a plan, which we presented to the National Science Foundation, that uh, put together both unmanned intelligence systems as well as driverless vehicles, autonomous, moving people, connectivity, making sure the cybersecurity, making sure that our technology, what we've been working on in different pockets, on several ivory towers, we could bridge them together and come together with this cohesive plan. And then we learned something. Hey, we can do great things together. And these traditional blocks of, oh, you're an aerospace engineer, oh, you're doing something in its civil, doing something in electrical, cybersecurity, arts and sciences. Hey, we want to get together and bring about a profound socioeconomic impact here in the city of Cincinnati. So join us. Work with us. We've got some good ideas, but you can help us turn those ideas into reality to make some sense for the city. And let's do great things here in the city of Cincinnati. Thank you very much. Dr. Cohen's a tough act to follow. Um, and uh, to that note, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker who has been an active collaborator with Smart Cincy and the Regional Smart Cities Initiatives 
uh, since day one. And um, quite frankly, the entire staff at the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments has been an enabler um, and someone that has been, well, an organization that has been uh, taking a forward step in leading these conversations to make sure that the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana region um, isn't just playing in this space, but is taking the necessary steps so that we can, in fact, lead in this space. And so with that, I'd like to introduce to the stage Robin Bancroft from the Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana Regional Council of Governments. Robin. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of T.C. Rogers, our OKI Board of Directors President, Mark Polinsinski, our CEO, and the entire OKI organization, I want to thank you for this opportunity to address you this morning. Um, I am Robin Bancroft, Strategic Initiatives Manager at the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Regional Council of Governments, and it's great to be with you. I'm not alone. I'm actually joined today by a third of our staff. Show of hands, staff. Come on, don't be shy. And, and I know that there are a number of our board members, committee members, um, so I'm speaking to many of you, part of the choir out there, um, but I invite uh, the opportunity today to get to meet so many new faces today. Um, our presence this morning, we're a little shy, but it shows our interest, our enthusiasm, and our support for the Smart Summit event. However, we're not here just to talk about the future, but to change our future through our continued collaboration and action. OKI is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky region. We serve two million residents across eight counties in Southwest Ohio, Southeast Indiana, and Northern Kentucky. And I wanna stress the word serve. We are a service agency working alongside not only our 118 board members, um, but public and private entities across our region, across the Midwest, and the entire United States. OKI is charged with planning the tri-state's transportation system and investing strategically in it to advance the region. And as such, our OKI mission to improve the quality of life and economic vitality for everyone aligns directly with that of the SMART, I like what Zach said, SMART Communities uh, Coalition. Technological innovation is occurring at a lightning pace and our region's ability to thrive and compete depends on our preparedness to embrace, embrace what's next. OKI is tasked with understanding what that next, what our future roadways and transit systems will look like so that we can plan and fund for our region's infrastructure. And technology will unquestionably help us preserve the existing system as well as optimize it. So, um, oops, my pages got mixed up here. I, I am uh, privileged to be part of a workshop with, my, um, with Thea Walsh from MORPSI, our sister organization, this afternoon, so I'll be happy to share more details about what we're doing as the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, but our focus at OKI is mainly on transportation, but I want to be clear that every aspect of a smart community and smart technology is of interest to us. New technologies are reshaping every aspect of our lives, so how people live, work, play, worship, shop, it all impacts how they move. So we at OKI have been and will continue to develop relationships that both educate us of the new technologies so that we can make more informed planning and investment decisions and introduce us, introduce us to new opportunities to partner and collaborate together. Now, I've been focused mainly, and a lot of times we got, get caught up in transportation planning talking just about the movement of people, but the movement of goods is just as important and something near and dear to my heart. Um, the roads, rails, river, and runways, how can this technological revolution improve safe and efficient freight movements? This is a question that we ask daily at OKI, and we by no means have all of the answers, but being part of this smart coalition helps us better understand and be informed. So one last thing before I go, I'm gonna make a shameless uh, but very intentional plug in regards to smart collaborations and freight. And I wanna invite each and every one of you to join OKI this August 15th through 17th when we host the 12th annual Ohio Conference on Freight here in downtown Cincinnati. The theme this year is Fast Forward 
freight, and it's a comment on the speed with which technology is developing to address both existing and future freight demands. We're going to have conference sessions on everything from blockchain to Uber Freight, from the impact, the Amazon impact on e-commerce to Hyperloop, and much, much more. So I invite you to visit okifreight.org, continue this conversation, uh, learn more. Uh, a registration is open, and we are accepting even session proposals. If you have a presentation idea, please share that with us. Uh, we have that open through next Monday, April 30th. So in closing, I just would say um, a question I ask myself every day is how I can bring my position, my interests, my talents, and resources to bear in this collaborative spirit, this effort to advance our region. So if you have not asked yourself that same question, what do I bring to this smart collaboration? Or if you're looking for the answer, I hope that your participation, active participation today, will leave you um, as you step out the door today with a clearer understanding of how you fit and you're part of this collaborative spirit. So thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Robin. Um, so our next speaker comes to us from the state, uh, well, not the State Department of Transportation, it's actually Drive Ohio now. Um, and I think it's particularly special for Cincinnati that we're starting to connect the dots between the smart cities efforts in and around Cincinnati to the smart cities efforts in and around Columbus that have earned attention, funding uh, at the national scale. Uh, we have the opportunity in Ohio to lead and to lead out front, and I think that Andrew Bremer's uh, participation today represents uh, us moving in that direction. So uh, without droning on any longer, I'd like to introduce Andrew Bremer from Drive Ohio. Andrew? Good morning, Cincinnati. I want to continue the energy and get you know all the good vibes continuing to going this morning and into the afternoon. So, uh, how many people have heard of Drive Ohio? Quite a few. I'm impressed. Um, so, how many people have also heard of Huffman Prairie? Yeah, a little less, but uh, still quite a good number. So, I'll tie these two things together. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Zach, and for everybody here uh, for having uh, the state of Ohio here. Uh, I'm not from the state. I'm, I'm here to help, though. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, my former title was uh, Deputy Director of Strategic Initiatives and Programs at the Ohio Department of Transportation. And that was a position created to just look at things that were sort of outside of the box uh, of normal DOT role. Uh, we have uh, care of our interstate highway system at ODOT. We have care of our U.S. and state routes outside of municipalities. Um, and uh, we rely on our local partners for a lot of the maintenance and operation of our local roadway system. Uh, but uh, the state DOT is, is rather limited in this new world of uh, automated and connected vehicle technology. That was sort of apparent to us in the summer of 2016 uh, when a company called Auto Moto LLC, that's Auto O T T O, uh, came to the Ohio Governor's office, uh, Ohio Governor John Kasich, and said they had a new product that they'd like to demonstrate for us. Governor's office and ODOT said, well, okay, uh, let's see what it can do. It was an autonomous truck. Uh, it was a Volvo stock, uh, Volvo semi uh, tractor trailer uh, that was outfitted with uh, roadway sensors in the form of cameras. Uh, uh, radar sensors on the front bumper, GPS systems, a whole host of other technological gizmos and doodads uh, that a lot of our engineers and a lot of our leadership didn't really have any familiar with. But as we continued our conversations with Auto and understood exactly what their business model was, what the system could do, uh, we asked for a couple of demonstrations just to run the truck up and down a couple of our routes. Uh, and what was apparent was the growing interest um, in a corridor outside of Columbus, uh, northwest of Columbus called US 33, uh, running from uh, the city of Dublin all the way through Marysville to East Liberty where the Transportation Research Center is. They did this demonstration uh, and we said, okay, we'd like to uh, have a full demonstration of the technology. Can you do this run autonomously? And a whole host of other questions started to come up. What type of insurance do you have? How do you insure a driverless system? 
what happens if you commit a lane violation or some other moving uh, violation that warrants your vehicle to be pulled over? What happens then? So these were questions that uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation wasn't really uh, equipped to handle. And that sort of laid the groundwork for the creation of Drive Ohio. But quickly back to the demonstration and, and sort of, um, you know, another question, how many people remember the Colorado auto beer truck run of uh, October 2016? Even less, oh wow. Okay, how many people know about the auto ODOT grind truck run in November of 2016? Nobody, okay, great. Oh, Thea, thank you, <laughs> you knew about that. So uh, we did a demonstration a month later from the famous Colorado beer truck run. I thought that brine was much more, uh, you know, much more of a headline than beer, but that was just me. Uh, but the system performed flawlessly. Uh, we assigned them that, uh, you know, you'll have the system turned off during the construction zones and doing the interchange moves, but uh, the, the demonstration really put the technology on the map that this is ready to go and we should be paying attention to it. Uh, at the same time, we looked at the, the connected vehicle world and all the sensors and suites um, associated with that. So uh, this past January in 2018, to address all those issues, the governor created Drive Ohio to address uh, the automated connected vehicle world and to partner with other organizations like th this one in Cincinnati to grow the ecosystem to develop uh, and to grow businesses that want to come and test in the state of Ohio and to do the research and development and eventually deployment. And so I mentioned uh, Huffman Prairie just as, you know, the Wright brothers, they did their research and development here. Uh, they had a prototype. Uh, they, they did that first in flight out in North Carolina at Kitty Hawk. And of course, the state of North Carolina takes great credit for that, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but the subsequent development and perfection of that technology uh, happened at Huffman Prairie, just around Dayton. So we think that we can do the same here in Ohio. Uh, there's a lot of firsts out there, all the development happening in California and other places. Uh, we'd like to continue the development and perfection of these technologies that, of course, save people's lives and make our roadways safer uh, and mitigate congestion and overall improve the quality of life. So let's keep this energy going, and I greatly thank you for my time that I have here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to have you here. Um, so our next speaker comes to us from CVG International Airport. Um, for those that are, are not familiar with the amazing things uh, that, is ha that are happening at CVG, uh, you're in for a treat. Please welcome CIO of CVG, uh, Brian Kopp. Thank you, Zach. Good morning, everyone. Where's PG? Is he still here? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to PG for calling those of us that are wearing a tie out early this morning. I would say remember me as the guy that was wearing the tie and the tie that binds the region together. <laughs> Please make sure the PNG hears that. Thank you, good morning. I'll also, I'll uh, echo uh, Tamaya's uh, comments as well. So why are we here? Why is the airport here? Um, we too want to innovate, and it's absolutely critical for us to get out ahead of this. Why? If you look at what's happening at the airport, and we'll use the business courier's comment just recently uh, this past week, of a torrid rise. Love the word torrid. Um, for those of you that remember our history, we've been through some challenging years. However, these past five years have just been a phenomenal ride. There is no appearance that that's going to abate anytime soon. So all of you that have flown out of CVG, let's see a show of hands. Shame on you that didn't raise your hand. We'll see you soon. Um, seriously, you can thank each other because it's taken the community that's brought CVG back to the point where we are now the fastest growing passenger and cargo airport in the U.S. for 2017. Yeah, good stuff. Even better is that we've continued that ride into the first quarter of 2018, and again, that is not going to slow down. So that's why we're here. We absolutely have to be a connected city. We have to communicate amongst ourselves and to try to figure out how we're going to navigate the future because the existing infrastructure that we have 
is not necessarily going to meet the needs of what's on the horizon. If you think about the employment needs automatically with, this, uh, with the airport kind of being out on the island, that island is going to need that thriving employment base to keep it running, right? So if we're short on the employment component, then subsequently we have a negative impact on the passenger experience that we don't want that either. So we have to work on the civility of bringing the fun and enjoyment back to air travel. And if we can do that for air travel, we can certainly bring that back to all forms of community transportation. And then last but not least, some of you have heard about uh, number one, DHL. Thanks to DHL for their tremendous partnership with CVG. Um, if you're not familiar with DHL, their second largest global hub is based here at, the, uh, at CVG. Um, Amazon, who's heard of Amazon, small company? Yeah, Amazon last year, 2017, announced their first global air hub would be based here at CVG. We're the first airport, to our knowledge, in the world that has two global hubs based right here. And that's, again, credit to our region. Now, what does that do? As we're communicating amongst ourselves, CVG, my team is over at the table. Gentlemen, wave hi. Thank you. Uh, that team is focused on working with you and continuing the collaboration because as we collaborate with organizations like Centrifuge, like Venture Smart, like Uptech, immediately we start to see the bandwidth that increases and we start to get attention on a global scale. Already the airport receives numerous invitations to come speak on issues like blockchain, like cybersecurity, like just immediate growth and how do you handle transportation needs. That did not come easy and it's a tremendous credit to this community that has put CVG on the map. For that, we thank you. Very much looking forward to today and the months to come and certainly the years. We will help you and us continue to grow as an amazing region. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. It's great to have you here today. Um, and we're excited that, uh, that you guys will be sticking around and participating for the rest of the programming. Um, so going to shift gears a little bit uh, and a, a little bit of a differentiation from the summit last year is that we've expanded the scope of the conversation to include our partners at the federal level. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Scott Towsley, who is joining us from Department of Homeland Security, Science and Technology. Scott. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zach, for the invitation and the chance to, to be here and participate. And that's really why I'm here, is to meet folks, participate, see what you're doing, because this whole smart city and community effort uh, is a bottoms up much more than a top down sort of effort. If you're following the story in Atlanta, that could be almost any major city or community around the country. It's a question of when, not if. And sometimes the hardest thing to do is to plan for success. We think clearly smart cities, smart communities is succeeding. It's going to keep succeeding. It's sort of an obvious imperative for all sorts of reasons. And when you look at any of the classic information technology spaces going back decades, um, security problems tend to follow success. And so our challenge is thinking about how do we bring the security conversation into this now and figure out how to help and whose communities are doing which kinds of things to help build some security capabilities in so that you essentially preempt things like Atlanta and other sorts of problems from happening. We have a history of that sort of conversation and work with NIST, our partners in this smart city and community effort. Uh, we have a history of this with the National Science Foundation. It's very easy for us to talk techie with, with University of Cincinnati and, and all the sort of folks that do classic sort of research. But the real action is how does it get deployed? Where does it pay for itself? How does it get sustained? How does it become sort of a natural culture? We live in a country where most of the time things work reasonably well and you don't have to stop and think, What's the security breakdown that's around every corner? Because they don't happen that frequently. But they're going to be out there. They're going to be out there in spades in a really successful community like the, the region here in Cincinnati and so on. And so we're trying to start the conversations with cities and communities around the country. 
how can we secure it? What are the most likely problems? How can we build this in over time so that as it succeeds commercially, as it succeeds in a partnership way, um, we can make sure that we don't fall behind and end up with a very successful system that is very susceptible to some sort of blocking attack, to some sort of ransomware, all the things that you see and, and read about in the, in the papers. At the same time, we're trying to have the same supporting conversation about privacy because in a technical sense, the privacy of the information treatment that flows in a smart city and community environment together with the security of what that free flow of data allows you to do, together with is it all going to operate safely in these big, messy, complicated systems that actually can kill people if something is wrong. All three of those are connected technically. They're not really yet connected in a design, in an organizational, in an operational sense, and we're trying to help those three sort of things come together over time and support the conversation. We see different examples of this around the country. That's one of the benefits of the, the role that I have is I get a chance to talk to different regions around the country and see who's doing what. Um, but this is really a bottom-up thing, so I'm here to listen and learn to a lot of the folks that are here. I'll try and grab each of you on the side in various spots throughout the day rather than uh, speechify to you now. So I appreciate the invite and look forward to participating today. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. It's, it's great to have you here with us today. Um, so this next speaker is somebody that uh, I connected with first this year, and I've been excited to uh, collaborate with her uh, in a number of. Uh, oh, I think are we are we out of order here? <laughs> what's on my page is different than what's on their page. Um, so uh, if, if Franco is going to go next, that's fine. Yeah. All right. So Franco and I met also within the last year. Um, and uh, when we look to the private sector for, for partners, it is great to have companies with the resources and capabilities of Oracle. Uh, so we're especially excited to have uh, Franco Amalfi, who is the uh, Director of Innovation for Oracle's North America uh, sector. Franco. Thank you, Zach. From the record, I'm not a her. And also, I listened. I took off my tie. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'm very excited to be here. I'm a part of Oracle. We're a team called Strategic Programs. We're, we're responsible for the go-to-market for our solutions for public sector. And we're very focused on innovation. We're focused, uh, we work with all levels of government, with the federal government, state, local. And lately, we've been doing a lot of work with communities on the smart city concept. It's, it's, it's great to see such a big movement happening here in the U.S., as well as in Canada, we cover both countries. Canada is having a smart city challenge that has drawn significant interest from all cities. And we're working with cities uh, like San Francisco, uh, San Jose, we're working with Las Vegas, uh, Atlanta, New York, and smaller cities as well across the board. And our goal is to really help these cities leverage data. If you look at smart city, at the end of the day, it's you have these sensors, you have the physical infrastructure, then you have the communications, but then all this data, you need to use it to be able to create better experiences for the citizens, as well as drive eff operational efficiencies for the cities and the, the, in order to be able to really make sense of these investments. So we've been investing over the last 40 years, a lot of, like, a lot of investments in making these data capabilities uh, optimal. We're doing a lot of work, uh, mo most recently, with AI, blockchain, IoT, autonomous, and uh, most recently we've been introduced a, a lot of new capabilities, autonomous uh, the software. Basically, we're taking machine learning and AI and infusing it into the databases, into the uh, applications, as well as in be able to protect the cybersecurity. It's getting more and more r difficult to manage these uh, threats and uh, they're getting more and more sophisticated, humans can keep up. So we're doing a lot of work to make sure that we have all the right tools from our machine learning and AI to do that as well. So we're very excited to be here. Thank you, Zach. Thank you all of you for having us. And we're looking forward to a great day. Thank you. I promise everybody here that's not the only mistake I'll make today. Um, so. Uh, the next speaker is somebody that uh, I first connected with um, through the Global City Teams Challenge program. Um, and since then, we keep bumping into each other in, in overlapping circles. So I'm especially excited to welcome to the stage Jean Rice. Please give her a round of applause and welcome. Good morning. 
so great to be with you today and uh, feel the energy and, uh, and everyone when looking and looking at how to make a region better for workforce development, economic development, innovation, and um, lots of great transportation applications. Um, I'm just glad I'm up here and I don't have to worry about the whole Thai thing, so I'm glad <laughs> to be here. Um, I work with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. We're a part of the Department of Commerce. And like Scott, our agency is trying to find ways to help cities and regions work at and innovate this whole smart city ecosystem. And the question is, how do we do it? Um, so let me tell you a little bit about what our agency does. Um, we work on many things. One, we manage federal spectrum. And you know, if you think about what's going to happen, and they say by 2025, there's going to be 30 to 50 billion more sensors out there, we need to share spectrum. And that's something that our agency is working on very diligently. Um, we also look, have a multi-stakeholder group working on cybersecurity and privacy. And we have a group that I work for, um, which is called Broadband USA, which works with cities and communities, companies and others to try to improve connectivity throughout rural areas and places where they don't have it. Work with them also where they need more infrastructure in cities and um, exurban areas as well. Um, and we also look at how can we help develop the whole smart city infrastructure in a way um, that is, I would say, people-centric. You know, I look at it in terms of, you know, everyone here, and I especially appreciated the council people talking about what their issues were, and I talk about people here talking about looking at transportation, mobility, whether it's on the ground or in the air, uh, and, and how to connect, and also looking at how um, you can improve people's lives. And so the whole people-centric design and solution is something we look at. And we also get a chance to look around the nation at what's being done. So for example, in Boston, they had an issue of like, how do I find out when my child's bus is nearby? So they had open data on transportation, they did a hackathon, and now they have an app so people can find out where it is. Um, you know, in a, in a rural community in San Mateo County, they had a problem, a homework gap low-income folks could not get um, access um, to broadband. They put in public Wi-Fi, um, and people did come and do the homework. Not only did the people who live there do their homework, but you know, migrant farmers from all over came in and used it for homework. It had kind of some unusual aspects, too. Because everyone was coming in, there was big economic development in that area. Um, and it also affected public safety. One time, all the other networks were down, and it was the only network that was up. Now it's looking at it as a backbone for public safety. So, you know, your ideas here are going to be great, and I think, you know, you can learn from other cities just like we do in other regions, and I think it will be great. One of the things we try to for, uh, work on is cross-silo and cross-border uh, and cross-sector collaboration. Um, and we do that by working with industry, um, with universities, with communities and cities, um, nonprofits, um, and any organization that is looking to kind of move forward this whole dialogue and do boots on the ground. How do we work it out? It's, you know, we're all going to have to pivot a little bit. We're going to have to learn as we go. But the goal is, how do we get there? Um, one of the things we're doing on the federal level is we participate in the NIDRD Smart Cities and Communities Task Force, and we do that with DOT and um, ITA and, you know, lots of uh, other agencies that are also looking at how do we support local governments? And, and as, a, as, a, as a group, we've pretty much said that our role is, you know, whether you're funding for, from NSF or you're looking at DOE for um, microgrids and, and smart grid kind of technologies, what is it that we can work together on to make sure that we can help communities with where they want to go um, with it? Um, and that's going, I think, very, very well. Um, we also work with the same group that Scott does, which is the Global Cities Team Challenge, um, which is with our sister agency who runs it, um, NIST. It's run by Soku Ri. Um, and it's a great program, which is basically trying to get cities, industry, universities, and others to work together so that they can collaborate, learn, and as they do it, scale a project, make sure it's sustainable, work on interoperability, and try to make it work in the local level. Then, you know, we do that through what we call action clusters, putting groups together. Then about a year ago, we said, hey, we're learning so much from the ground up on these action clusters, we should start a super clusters. So we have them in many areas, including transportation, public safety, public Wi-Fi and wireless, um, and the whole, and utilities, and they develop blueprints so that 
every community does not have to start from scratch. You can get an idea, some ideas that have come. So I do suggest you go on the Global City Team Challenge um, website, take a look at the blueprints. It, they're really helpful depending on what sector you're interested in. Take a look at them. Um, and then I'm hoping that some of you will also collaborate um, with us on that. And I just want to mention that um, part of what we do is we, with NTIA, NIST, and uh, NSF, foster a forum for the leaders of the superclusters, which come from all sectors, um, to work together on how do we collaborate and uh, how do the federal agencies help you. Now, I just want to mention we have several people who are leaders from the GCTC. Would you mind standing up? Zach? <laughs> It's just an amazing amount of work and, and, and effort. And, and I know that uh, Zach had you all congratulate yourselves, but I, you know you need to congratulate yourselves as well. Let me get, let's let me give you a hand again for you guys. Um, I just think that you know we have a lot of superclusters. The ones that NTIA is particularly fostering is the wireless supercluster. So we're looking at different technologies and how they will help and support uh, governments and. Um, that's going to be kind of the next level. Last year it was a public Wi-Fi blueprint. This time it's going to be looking at new technologies, and every year will be separate technologies. Um, there's a new supercluster starting on education. We have one that is started on uh, smart ag in rural, um, where we're also looking at not just um, farming, smart ag, um, but we're also looking at different things like rural communications and connectivity um, and how to help rural communities with health care. Um, and, you know, there's just amazing kind of things happening there, like um, supply chain analysis and, and smart sensing for food, food sheds. Just a tremendous amount of activity and uh, peace. So I just have to say that this is an exciting day again, and I really would want to learn from you and what you're doing. It sounds like you've got a great beginning, and um, anything we can do to help, please let us know. Thank you. <laughs>